Maybe the most important part of these RPGs aren't the critical hits, or the status effects, or the bosses. Maybe the real value was the friends we made along the way. RPGs are one of the best ways for a video game to tell a long-form story. In RPGs, a great set of party members can give an otherwise bland and predictable story the right punch to become something that will stick with you for a long time. But what makes for a good party? It's not just about the character archetypes you use or the ships you want. A good party can be made with any set of characters you can dream up, if you do it right. Party chemistry is about more than any one person, and it's a marathon. It's the factors that play characters off of each other. It's good motivations and characterizations. And putting all the pieces together like a jigsaw puzzle to create something more dynamic than the sum of its parts. Let's talk about some factors that go into party design, the characters in them, and the sorts of character dynamics you'll want to make a memorable party. Wait, who's this? Moneybags? The wealthy financier? Hell yeah, get in this party. Moneybags, your true motivation this whole time was to sell Skillshare. It all makes sense now. Skillshare just got a new class by Thomas Frank called Productivity for Creatives. Build a system that brings out your best. It's about building the right sort of systems and environment to help speed up your creativity and help take your mindset to one that works better for creative professionals. It's helped me get more done during the day and got this episode finished earlier, actually. It's been super worth it. Skillshare has thousands of inspiring classes for creators. Improve your professional life, learn a new hobby, or just explore your creativity. You could dip your toes into photography now that things are opening up again, or dabble in illustration just for something new. Skillshare is ad-free and they're launching new classes all the time, so you can follow wherever your creativity takes you. The first thousand people to click the link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. Go do it. It's fun. I will never forget you or your amazing value, moneybags. Goodbye. A great party is built on a great foundation, and you can start building that foundation by paying attention to three big things. Intra-party dynamics, pacing, and story structure. There's plenty more to do on top of that, but you could spend your entire life studying story structure alone. For a 15 minute intro video, we're gonna start with the basics of the basics. Oh, and some light to medium spoilers are incoming. Have a spoiler card. First up, intra-party dynamics. Great parties don't usually start as a group of strangers. More often, a party is made up of a bunch of people who already relate to each other somehow. It's not that everyone knows everyone else necessarily, but each member of the group should have connections to someone within, and if you drew out the links, the party would look like a single net of relationships. What those connections are can be anything. Characters might be longtime friends, co-workers, lovers, rivals, secret enemies, family. A great party starts with some connections between characters and develops and changes those connections over time. One of my favorite RPG parties is the main group in Final Fantasy X. The core of the game story is about a band of people going on a pilgrimage from one religious shrine to another. The party is made up of one person who needs to make the pilgrimage to save the world, a set of bodyguards she's known since she was a kid, her estranged cousin, her dad's best friend who really knows what's going on, and a rando hot boyfriend material dude that washed up on the beach one day. His name's Titus. Or Titus. I don't care. Everyone in the party relates to each other in a variety of ways. Even Titus, the odd man out, has connections through Orin, quickly establishes himself as Yuna's love interest, and has plenty of other plot threads tying him to the events and themes to come. Although, starting a story with a group of well-connected people can run into one specific problem early. It's tough to find natural reasons for your characters to spout lore if they already know each other and are comfortable in the story's setting. If they aren't mentioning things to each other, that's one less tool a writer can use to get the player up to speed. Stories set in a world with fantastical elements, like any Final Fantasy game, need to dump a lot of exposition and lore to set the stage properly. Even stories that just take the player through unusual territory in the real world can run into this problem. Like, say, if you made a game about a secretive ancient society of... legitimate businessmen working in shipping, or at a nursing home, or something. 
The less familiar the player already is with your material, the more likely this will come up. Final Fantasy X gets around this with a classic fantasy setting trope, the fish out of water character. They aren't accustomed to the world, but are learning about it as they build connections to familiar characters. It gives writers a natural avenue to explain the basics in universe and inform the player in the process. The characters telling Titus about their relationships, history, motivations, and fears fill in the player at the same time. It adds another exposition technique in addition to others like context clues, data logs, and flashbacks. As Titus learns more about the culture of spirit and the nature of the greater threat, the intraparty dynamic develops. Yevon's prejudice against the Albed sets the stage for both Waka and Riku's character arcs and how those characters clash and play off of each other. The hardships in Kilika and Operation Meehan flesh out Yuna's character in particular, reminding us what's at stake and just how far she's willing to go, and just what Lulu, Waka, Kimari, and Orin have signed up for. Each of their individual story arcs are impacted by the arcs of others, and the collective development helps make the party feel like a cohesive entity. As the crew gets closer and closer to their end goal, it helps give the later stages of the game a stronger emotional payoff. A less successful version of the same thing shows up in Octopath Traveler. The game's good, but Octopath's intra-party dynamics are not its strong suit. Each party member is optional to pick up, and there really aren't all that many threads connecting their individual story arcs. Everyone has a perfectly decent progression in their own personal arc, Alvin's search for meaning, Primrose's revenge plot, Ophelia's quest to impersonate Yuna, they're all solid stories to tell, but there's very little overlap between them. Well, until a very, very late optional side quest, and I'm not super enthusiastic about counting that. The only interactions they have during the story are in scenes where they dim the lights, have the characters stand around like a stage play, and lightly comment on what just happened. The arcs weren't really able to overlap because they advance in stages. You could take the stages on in any order, so any character change over time might not come through sensibly if they had to react to or appear in the events of another character's arc. Regardless of the reason though, the characters wound up feeling like their own little islands, and the party itself had almost no dynamic to speak of. The party dynamic is an independent thing. A well-crafted party doesn't depend on having a great main plot. Final Fantasy XV's main plot was literally unfinished for a long time. On release, the setup and backstory for main characters was partially told in an anime and an animated movie you probably didn't watch. Even now, it's sorta unfinished. And yet, the inter-party dynamic of the four main party members is fantastic. The game is all about brotherhood, and the lengths each of the main cast will go to protect each other. You get a sense of that in the main plot, even when the story events are not told especially well, but the flood of side content really highlights the friendship between the four. The long drives, stopping by diners for food, going camping, taking photo ops, none of that depends on the game's backdrop of fighting giant monsters and saving the world. It's all developed one mundane moment at a time, through the small talk, the inside jokes, the body language, even the silent animations that run as they rest in a hotel help convey a sense of friendship. It's a rare thing in RPGs to find this sort of easygoing friendship that's primarily delivered through small moments throughout rather than a cutscene loudly proclaiming that everyone is friends now. The game nails the feeling of a grounded, believable relationship between four longtime friends on a road trip, and makes the bond they have incredibly relatable. Okay, sounds like your cast is on the right track. Everyone's got their own things going on, and they're all synergizing with each other. The next thing to think about is how to keep up the pace. Each party member needs their time in the spotlight, but each also needs to stay relevant as long as they're going to be around. This can trip up even the best RPGs. The size of your party can play a big role in how you plan your character development. It's not as if a cast has to be small to feel cohesive throughout a game, but it is easier to make a smaller party work. The less characters there are, the more time each member will have in the spotlight. Though with fewer cast members, the stakes are higher. Party members are support pillars. The more there are, the more easily the cast as a whole will stand up even if a few pillars are weak. A smaller cast needs each party member to be strong for the party dynamic to hold up over time. Bug Fables does a great job in characterizing its small cast. Team Snakemouth is made up of just three characters, a self-centered bee named Vi, a stalwart beetle named Kabu, and Leaf, a mysterious and blunt moth. 
The small team size gives plenty of time for the plot to flesh out each character, and room for the trio dynamic to develop and become tighter-knit over time. Each character joins in fairly early on, and the game makes sure to keep each relevant throughout the entire story. Their personalities balance each other out, and their individual backstories and character arcs progress at an even pace. You couldn't really say there's a single main character in Bug Fables. No one in the party really outshines anyone else, and they all rely on each other for support as they develop their own arcs. They share the spotlight equally as a team. With fewer characters, the writers could spend more time polishing each one. There's a unique conversation the party can have in every room in the world, and there's even custom dialogue for each member when scanning enemies for information in battles. Their dialogue stays true to their own thoughts and reactions to make the characters feel more consistent, and that attention to detail shows up throughout the game. The contrast between Bug Fables and its most direct inspiration, Paper Mario, is striking. You get plenty of partners in Paper Mario, but they're each given very little, if any, character development time after their introductory chapter is over. After that point, each party member essentially becomes a living Zelda dungeon item. Especially in the original game, each party member becomes completely interchangeable outside of their specific battle skills. The second game does a little better, but it's pretty close to the same problem. Vivian abandons her abusive sisters to help you out, and then she's just there for the rest of the game. Bobbery overcomes his grief to sail the seas again, and then he's just... there. Sure, it's easier to write. It might not even make sense in every case for everyone to have something poignant to say about every plot situation, but it's a missed opportunity to nurture the budding party chemistry. According to the developer Moonsprout, Bug Fables was designed to have a small, focused main cast in direct response to this problem with Paper Mario. Okay, small, intimate casts are nice to get to know well, but let's go over to the other extreme. Huge, expendable casts. Some party members aren't supposed to last forever. Gains with optional party members, or ones you can permanently lose, can force you to dramatically change your approach to characterizing your party. Having a key, plot-driving party member get permanently removed from the game could be a fun angle if you plan for it, but it's more likely to just freeze your story in its tracks. Expendable characters are more often forced into background roles, only taken front stage in their own dedicated side arcs, if they have any at all. It's a very tricky type of party to write narratives for. The Mass Effect trilogy just takes the challenge head on. Most of your squad mates are both optional and expendable. They can either be ignored entirely, or die at key points based on choices you make, with the story continuing without them. Without careful planning, this story structure could have led to wildly different branching paths. But in Mass Effect, it usually leads to one of two things. Either future moments with a character you've lost are completely skipped, or a scene will feature a different, less interesting character acting as a direct replacement. Once in a while, a scene will play out with some extra drama, but it's usually just missing, or it has someone else going through the motions. If you wanted to make expendable characters matter more in the plot, you might think to just make dialogue more interchangeable. If you do that, you might end up with a situation like in Chrono Cross. Chrono Cross doesn't have expendable characters, but it does have very interchangeable dialogue in its cutscenes, and it highlights how it can cause problems with characterization. Chrono Cross is known for its very large cast of party members, but it's a really paper-thin set. There are maybe a dozen characters that have any real motivation or say in what's going on, and the rest of the group has maybe one character motivation each. If that. This guy's entire purpose is being a pun. The plot specifies generic dialogue that whoever is in your active party will say, and the game does have a pretty cool text accent system where characters will give that generic dialogue with their specific affectation. But generic dialogue is no replacement for a central character motivation. Another option is to just sidestep the problem. Strategy RPGs like Fire Emblem or Valkyria Chronicles have dozens of expendable characters, with names and distinct personalities. Almost none of them will directly affect the main story, but they'll often have a lot of side content to interact with. Optional missions and support conversations help flesh out their personalities and let them shine even when they aren't directly plot relevant. You'll start to get attached, which will help raise the emotional stakes of every fight now that you've gotten to know everyone in your squad. And if you lose someone, oh well. The plot chugs along with some optional branches blocked off. It's devastating to you, but not the plot. So that's some of the very basics of how to make better parties, but there's plenty more to talk about. 
head down to the comments, where we'll be talking about some of your favorite party dynamics and why they work for both the story and gameplay. Add your own and talk to others about what you think they did to get it right. If you can fill your story with deep connections and dynamic characters, you can turn a ragtag group of wannabe sky pirates into a real party.